I'm Evan Smith, the CEO of the Texas Tribune, and I want to welcome you to a conversation with Ambassador Kate Bailey Hutchison, the latest in the Tribune's signature series of public events that bring clarity, context, and perspective to the day's headlines. Today we'll talk about Russia and Ukraine, the future of global alliances, and the dangerous and perplexing state of our world. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and thanks as well to our sponsor, the Permian Basin Petroleum Association. Ambassador Hutchison served from 2017 to 2021 as the 22nd United States Permanent Representative to NATO. From 1993 to 2013, she was a U.S. Senator from Texas, the first and only woman in state history to hold that office. And before that, she held the now defunct office of state treasurer. In the 70s, she was vice chair of the National Transportation Safety Board and spent four years as a member of the Texas House of Representatives at a time when she was one of very few Republicans and even fewer women in the lower chamber. A native of Galveston, she is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and the University of Texas Law School. Ambassador Hutchison, welcome. Thank you, Evan. It's great to be here. Very nice to see you. And Ambassador, could you have imagined during your posting overseas what's happening in the Ukraine? It, it, it seems unreal. Or maybe the problem is that it seems real, entirely real. Shocking, but not that surprising. What do you think? Oh, it's surprising. Yeah. I, I did not think in 2022 we would see the horrific... Um, devastation of a, of a country that is a democracy, is a, uh, a good, honest, elected democracy, and a valiant effort uh, by the president and, and others in the parliament. I went to Ukraine. I met with so many of the members of parliament, and it was so inspiring because they are reformers. They want to have a real democracy and freedom. It's a beautiful country. And uh, I was inspired by all of them and how they, they had differences, uh, but everyone was going in the direction of we want to be like the West. We want to be in the EU. We want to be in NATO. And of course, we were trying to be helpful uh, and encouraging because we want everyone in the world to live in freedom. We do. And so uh, to, to see a country that is just very peaceful and very uh, democratic suffer this through nothing they have done is unspeakable. And it's hard to get language that's um, descriptive of something so horrible. Right. Ambassador, didn't we see this coming or shouldn't we have seen this coming? Certainly the drumbeats were audible. Uh, 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 Vladimir Putin indicated uh, he pretty much told us what he was going to do. Um, so w wasn't it something that we could have or should have seen coming? And also, was it avoidable? Could we have done anything? Could anyone have done anything to prevent this from happening? Well, I think that what we saw and didn't recognize was um, the seriousness with which Putin was, was trying to recreate the Soviet Union. The right. mother Russia uh, should have been expanded in his view. And one thing that we did see when I was at NATO uh, and hearing all of the, the people who went in and out of Russia and what people were saying is Putin had for years been um, messaging to his military, messaging to the people that we were robbed. We were uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union through glasnost. Uh, he called Gorbachev a traitor uh, to, to the Soviet Union. And um, so you hear that, and, but you don't think that someone would really follow through on these countries that have become democracies. Right. And they have fought for that democracy, and they've, uh, they've celebrated it. And you don't think that that would really be an option that uh, a dictator would be looking to 
to change by force. Of course, he's not just any dictator ambassador. I want to ask you about that. Did you have any occasion to meet or to get to know Putin when you were uh, posted overseas? What's your impression of him? Did you get to know Zelensky when you were overseas? What's your impression of him? Well, I did not meet either of them. I'm, I did meet Poroshenko, the uh, previous president, who is being interviewed a lot now on TV in his military gear and being very, very supportive of everything that the Ukraine is doing um, and fighting. He's out there in the streets. He's in Kiev. Um, but I met him. So that's where, when I went to Kiev, he was the president. And um, uh, I didn't meet Zelensky, but was very impressed. Oh, I'm immensely impressed with what he's done uh, since he was elected. Um, and I think that, that he has risen uh, to great heights and, and for the history books. Right. How unlikely, just given his backstory, right, that he would be this extraordinary hero on behalf of democracy, not just there, but yeah. all over the world. Right? Given his background, yeah. uh, amazing, just amazing. And when you see the pictures of him doing his sort of dancing with the stars uh, routine and, right. and being a comedian, uh, you don't think of someone... Uh, with that whole background becoming the superior leader that yeah. he is. And extraordinarily brave, right? And modeling for everybody else how, how to do it. Absolutely. Right. So, so talk, about, talk about Putin. So you, you did not actually get to know him, but you, you surely uh, got an impression of him and yes. had an impression of him. Well, yes. And we dealt yeah. with the, uh, the Russian ambassador and, and all of the things that they were doing in Europe. Putin has been doing cyber attacks all over our alliance, including us, of course, including the United States, but also Canada and our European allies. And uh, Putin has been trying to disrupt ever since I was there but, and, and before through cyber, taking both sides of a controversial issue in a country and uh, doing the social media, and, and then uh, spreading false information uh, that would disrupt a populace. And As so you know, there are many people in this country who believe that he's had his hands on issues in our country, that he's had his hands on our electoral system in our country, that he's intervened on behalf of his preferred candidate in now not one but two elections in this country. Oh, I think that he, he has done uh, much malign activity in the United States, not only in the political process, but on social issues, on uh, issues where uh, a school shooting, right. uh, you would see the Russian um, way of cyber activity on both sides of the gun control issue because of a school shooting. The He'd be messaging to the people who were anti-gun and said that was the reason, or people that were pro-gun and said you For the purpose of dividing more. communities. Exactly. Right. That's what his... Yeah. And he thought, I believe, uh, that attacking Ukraine would be like he did in Crimea, he did in Georgia. Oh, everybody uh, ranted for a, a few months and we right. put on some insignificant sanctions and then we moved on. He thought that that would yeah. become a debate in NATO he thought that NATO would probably not be uh, united um, and that whatever he did, there would be enough discussion about it that nobody would really take uh, one side and, and it wouldn't be that serious. Yeah, he miscalculated. Uh, I, think he, I think he brought NATO together and right. made it stronger. Turned out he, was, uh, he, he united everybody. Absolutely. Uh, uh, President Biden, as you know, uh, Ambassador, has called uh, Putin a war criminal and has called for a war crimes trial. So has President Zelensky. Are they right? Is he a war criminal? Should there be a war crimes trial? Oh, absolutely. I don't, you know, I don't think we need to dwell on it right now. I'm glad that all of the evidence is being preserved and it's in the public media. Yeah. If just what we have seen in the public media well, in Bukha, right? The, 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 Bukha. Hor the horrible oh devastation, absolutely. which, by the way, the Russians are now saying has been staged by leaders yes. in Ukraine to cause the world to, to hate Russia. But in fact, there's no evidence of that. That's right. And that's exactly right. Well, and you had news media showing the 
pictures of what right. what was actually happening at the time. So you had totally, um, you, you and you had it from all sides. I mean, that that's the Russian way of doing things. They always have an excuse. Like when the when this whole start whole thing started, Putin said, "Well, Zelensky's a Nazi, and I'm going to rescue the Ukraine people from right. this Nazi. from this Nazi." Right. Are you kidding? Right. I mean, that was just bizarre. But but they actually say things like that in a, with a straight face. I mean, I I've been in meetings with the Russian ambassador at NATO, and they say things like that that are just bizarre. And and you think how can these people be serious and say something like that? Uh, what you said earlier, Ambassador, about uh, Putin's goal being to basically put back together the the old Soviet Union. Uh, there are, you know, peace talks at different stages of seriousness that are allegedly going on here, or they're being floated at least. And there have been plans floated that would actually involve uh, P Putin and Russia getting back a portion of the territory in question. And people are saying, well, you know, if he only gets that, then that would actually be a good end to all of this. I mean, wouldn't that be essentially giving in to a bully if we give, if we allow, if the world allows him to claim any territory back? It's kind of his goal, isn't it? Well, it's most certainly his goal. I think you can see what we would judge is a pulling back over to the east, which is where he has been trying to get right. the land bridge um, over the sea. He wants uh, to, ha he's always wanted more water access and the putting the, the Russian dissidents into the Donbass uh, he's been doing that for years right. to disrupt. Uh, so he's wanted that eastern part, and you see now that they're coming back into that focus and and being mo very horribly brutal uh, in those uh, cities. So you see that, and and I don't want to say anything about what Zelensky and the Ukraine people will want to come out of this in the way of a negotiation because we're not shedding that blood. They are. And what they decide to do is what we should support. So if they, if they now, did, did make a deal to allow the Russians to exit this whole catastrophe with a portion of the territory in question, we should not, from the outside, judge that, even though it might seem to us that somehow Putin has won. I don't see how we could. Right. I don't see how we could criticize. Right. Uh, I don't think we should be um, telling uh, Zelensky anything. Right. But you're not that, advocating for that. that. Would, I'm not. I, I just don't think it's our place to do it. While those people are suffering and dying and showing such a spirit, right. uh, I wouldn't be critical of anything. Do I hope they can stay whole? Absolutely. I want them to stay whole. I want them to have Crimea back. Um, is that realistic? Probably not. Evan, it's hard to say that that is. Uh, Ambassador, so back to Zelensky for a second. So he has been making the rounds. He spoke to Congress. He's spoken to the Grammys. He's spoken to the United Nations more recently, pleading his case for more help. In his latest remarks, he's called for stepped-up economic sanctions, which he says are consistent with the brutality of the crimes committed, the severity of the crimes committed. He wants more aggressively target uh, to more aggressively uh, for us to target all of us to target Russian banks and energy companies. Is there more that we could be doing? Is there more that we should be doing? If you got to decide, would we be doing more in the way of economic sanctions? Absolutely. Yeah. I would do everything to cripple their economy. Right. Because until um, he suffers and his people begin to say, wait a minute, wh why would we be suffering like this, there's something wrong Isn't here. Isn't that sort of happening though, Ambassador? And, and I wonder if, if you would be specific about the things, if you can, about the things that we're not currently doing that you think we should do. I mean, because we are doing some things. Oh, we're doing quite a bit. Right. But I, I think there's much more we can do in weapons. I think sea uh, missiles that hit ships is very necessary. I think we ought to give them the MIGs that they're asking for through our allies. Um, and I, I think we should, all of our allies should be willing to give anything they can to help these people fight for themselves.
we are not on the ground there. They are. And they are freedom-loving people who love their country, and we should help them right. in every way to fight for themselves. Right. Does our messaging about what's happening over there necessarily advance the ball? Does it help? Does it hurt? I'm, re I'm reminded, of course, of President Biden saying at the end of his remarks in Poland on, on March 28th, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power. This was taken as a call for regime change. There was a walk back from that. But there are a lot of people who say, actually, in politics, the gap is when you tell the truth, right? That actually maybe he said something that other people would not find that objectionable. Maybe the, the Russian people ought to make a decision that there should be a change in, in regime. What, what did you think about that? And what do you think generally about the idea of us encouraging the Russian people to take hold of the situation and possibly change out their leader? I think we should make every effort to show the Russian people what is happening. Because this is not a war on the Russian people. Yeah. It is not. And they are um, victims of this madman. Right. And so I, I think everything we can do to show the, the uh, Russian people what's happening is important because in the past, it has been popular uprisings that, has ca have, that have caused uh, dictators to fall. Right. And the, this one um, has, I think, um, kept his team at bay so that he is not uh, allowing people to say the truth to power. Right. And I think it is important that we try to enlighten the people of Russia. So is it appropriate for us to say out loud, we should, this guy can't stay in power, you should do something about it? I mean, did you think the president, did the president screw up? Let me ask it straight away. Well, he said something that most people think, agree with. But right. for a president to say it was probably uh, something, the reason that it was pulled back, um, because we do have a policy in America not to assassinate somebody else's president. Right, but there's one, it's one thing to assassinate. It's another thing to suggest strongly that the people of that country make a decision different from the one they've made, right? That to me well, seems a far, a far walk from an assassination. Well, I think that um, you can't tell tell other people what to do about their own leadership. But you can certainly tell them the truth about what the right. leader is doing. Do you think generally that President Biden has done a good job on this? I think here's something that he did that is different that I think was very, very right. And that was to share the intelligence immediately um, upon uh, hearing from the intelligence community what was being planned. I think there are areas where we could have moved faster and should have have gotten in with the weapons buildup when we right. saw the buildup on the border. Um, I think that when, when Putin was putting 100,000 people on the border, that was a signal we should have acted on much stronger, I think. Right. Um, but I think sharing the intelligence was, was wise. great. You know that the president's been criticized uh, for pursuing a diplomatic solution in response to what we believed was a military buildup and the situation that has now materialized. People said, well, we should have seen that coming. And instead, the president went the route of, uh, of, of diplomacy first. Was that a mistake? I mean, you're a former diplomat yourself. The reality is we do use dip diplomacy in this country. We hope to use it to hold off what has happened. Was there something wrong with him doing it in this case? Well, I think, again, it, it wasn't that we wouldn't always make the conversation as long as we could, but it was not fortifying while we were talking. We should have done both ends. Yes. But both ends. Um, as you know, uh, Ambassador, this is not the first administration criticized for not acting quickly enough on Ukraine. Both Presidents Obama and President Trump um, for different reasons, delayed aid and denied requests for arms and caught hell for it, right? In retrospect, you agree it was a mistake. Previous administrations, not just the last one, but the one before that. As we look back in the rearview mirror, 
Well, as you look back in the rearview mirror, we definitely should have, if, if we had known how serious Putin would be, then yes, there should have been more. But Evan, I think you do have to go back and look at, at what happened in Afghanistan yeah. as something that would at least cause a test of our resolve. And I think that we have to be very firm and very strong. And I think we are. I think in this instance, America is speaking with our voice, but with a united voice of our allies and our partners, our 40 partners. We have 30 allies. We have 40 partners that are being very helpful in most regards um, with the sanctions yeah. and with uh, even providing arms. Um, but I do think that we must pass this test because if, if anyone is looking at how the response has been to this, I think they're going to think very carefully about doing something a over. Si a similar deal right, right. in the That's future. Right. You know, this, this begs the question, Ambassador, about the proper role of the U.S. in uh, the, the midst of situations like this. We hear so many debates about whether the U.S. should be the world's policeman. We hear that at election time, but we actually hear it not at election time, whether it's in our national interest to get involved in situations like this. Do you doubt that it's in our national interest to be there? I mean, there are people who are arguing today it's not in our national interest to be involved. It is. Let the record show that you rolled your eyes. Yes, and yeah. I, you can just let the record show yeah. because I believe, and I'll quote Madeleine Albright, yeah. America is the essential leader of the world. We are the essential leader of the world. Right. And I know from where I sat in NATO, our allies want us to lead. They want us to be the one that calls out a risk yeah. and then urges them to deter against it. And, and that's what we do. We push our allies and they want us to. Yeah. And right now we uh, have, we, we have, I, I know when I was there and America came out with their strategic review and said, China is where we really must focus. It is China that will rise and that we need to make sure that we are protecting all of our interests if they do. Yeah. And all of our allies were going, China? Yeah. What? Do you think that's what? a mistake? I think that we are the ones that have to do that. Right. And I think we have to be strong yeah. and we have to keep commitments. And our allies need to know that we're going to be standing with them and our adversaries need to know that we are going to do what we say we're going to do. Ambassador, I need to ask you, because of this discussion, you've said a couple times today that you thought we should be sending weapons or should have sent weapons to the Ukraine. You've said this before. We had an opportunity in the last administration in which you served when President Zelensky himself was asking for weapons. And President Trump's response was, you know, I need you to do me a favor. He wanted dirt on then Vice President Biden, who he knew would be a candidate against him in the next election. And you know what? President Trump just in the last couple of weeks has again called on President Putin to release dirt on the Biden family if there is dirt to be released. We're mingling domestic politics and global security. Is this a good thing? Was that a good thing? Should we have honored the request to President Zelensky back during the Trump administration to provide the weapons that we're talking about? Well, I think that we should be an ally of a country that is sitting on the Russian border, that is uh, trying to form a democracy, that yeah. wants to get into the EU and NATO. Uh, you know, l let me just go back to the Maidan revolution. Okay. Those Ukrainian people have had such a commitment to their freedom. They ran off the Russian-dominated president that they had uh, by standing in their Maidan Square for months through winter, through s summer heat, through winter cold and yep. starving, 
Um, and we should have helped them more to get ready. Now, I will, have, I will say that our military has been working with the um, military in Ukraine for years. Uh, certainly uh, through the last two presidents, if not three or four. Well, since um, the real elections were held and right. the reform movement had started. Right. And um, we should be always helping people who are trying so when, so when to become yeah, free. When such a request comes, we should take it seriously. Yeah. And not commingle domestic politics. I don't see um, why we would um, even look at a domestic issue when we see a country forming a democracy. It, we've done it for all of these former uh, um, autocratic right. governments, most dominated by the Russians, and we've helped them. Let's be consistent yeah. in doing it. But let me ask you about NATO. Um, something that happened yesterday, in fact. 63 Republicans in the United States House of Representatives, including 11 Texas Republicans, voted no on a non-binding resolution reaffirming unequivocal support for NATO as an alliance founded on democratic principles. These are not just burnt end of the brisket Republicans, Ambassador. Kay Granger voted no, who not long ago he would have thought of somebody who was a little bit more toward the center of the party. What's going on here? What's the problem with NATO? Why won't we just say we support NATO as, a, as an organization that has the right values? You know, I, I don't know what was the wording in that well, resolution. I just read you the exact wording. Unequivocal support for the North Atlantic, North Atlantic Treaty Organization as an alliance founded on democratic principles. Seems pretty much straight up the fairway, doesn't it? Well, I have not seen the whole thing, but I know we have bipartisan support for NATO. Right. I know that. Now, if there's some feeling that we haven't done, that NATO hasn't right. done enough, or the UN certainly hasn't done enough, um, I haven't talked to anyone about that vote. Um, or, but you or the still reasoning. support NATO. You know from the inside. Well, I know what this that we have bipartisan support. Right. We the have. public, in fact, today, I'll tell you, uh, Ambassador, the Quinnipiac poll today, eight in 10 Americans polled think that U.S. membership in NATO is somewhat or very important. 68% think that NATO plays an important role in global security. As you say, yeah. this is not an open question among the public. It is not, nor is it in Congress. I don't know what the background is on that vote, but um, you know we have a NATO observer group in the Senate that's led by uh, Jean Shaheen and Tom Tillis, and they work together. I brought, I brought my colleagues from NATO over at the uh, 70th anniversary celebration, and I took them to the Senate, and we had Republican and Democratic. Um, uh, senators talking to our colleagues, our uh, right. ambassadors, and uh, and I wanted our ambassadors to see how we we will put in our campaigns that we support NATO, that we support a strong military, that we are uh, for uh, backing up what we say we will do, and and that's a bipartisan. Um, view. I wanted my colleagues to see it because in Europe, until the last month, yeah. we'll value other things over military spending. They'll hide their military spending. Sometimes uh, when we're saying you need to do more for your own defense, they'll hide their military spending in other parts of the budget so that they're not accused of supporting a military. And I was trying to show our allies, look, we celebrate supporting our military. We celebrate uh, being a deterrence organization because we think that's the way you stop a war. So uh, I think that we have that bipartisan support. I've seen it, I've worked with my colleagues. I go back to the Senate and talk to my colleagues uh, regularly and uh, everyone is supportive right. of NATO. So last question, uh, Ambassador, what, when and how does this end? So, you know, many of us are trying to see to the last scene of the movie here. Yeah. It's very hard to see how this ends or ends well or ends quickly. 
So what do you what do you think happens here? Well, you know, General Milley, who is really right there on the front line, um, said yesterday in his hearing that this is going to be a long yep. war. That um, and the military guys have dealt with Putin. They they do have communications for um, for correcting mistakes. They have red phones on their desks uh, that if something happens, they call and they say, what does this mean? What are you doing? Uh, it's mill to mill. They've had that. They know these Russian military people. And they believe and they say that this is going to last a long time. And the more atrocities that are occurring uh, by the Russians, the longer there is going to be a, a war because I think Putin is desperate. Yeah. I think he is uh, trying to show something of a win. And he's now, I think, uh, trying to go for taking some of this territory. And um, that's what our military people are saying. Is there a point at which you think we need to get more involved actively, boots on the ground? Is there, some, is there a line that would be crossed? Is there a threshold where you would say, as much as we think we want everybody to come together, we as the United States need to get more directly involved because a line's been crossed? I don't, it, the, here's what I think that is, is being done right. I think the president said right off the bat that we're not going to put our boots on the ground. And he's thinking in the terms of, of the times that we put American blood in foreign wars uh, like Vietnam, right. like Korea. Um, and, and he is just taking that stand. And I don't argue with that. But I think the red line is going to be if anything affects a NATO, any NATO ally, we're in. We're going to keep that commitment. We need to show we're going to keep that right. commitment, and we will. Because if Putin comes into one country of our alliance, and, and it, he could take a small one, and it would right. be Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. Well, why would we do that? Why would we fight for Latvia, for God's sakes? We would fight for Latvia because that wouldn't be the end. That would be the beginning. That's just the beginning. That's right. And so that means we go to war over any one of those, because if we don't, it's not going to be one that he will do. It will be one, two, three, and right. then the next one. Very well. So uh, we're going to keep that commitment. And the red line is if he does anything that affects our alliance. And if he uses weapons that will go over into our alliance, then I think that's when we start saying, this is it. Well, uh, this is it here on our end, Ambassador. With that, we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador K. Billy Hutchinson. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Reminder that the Texas Tribune Festival is back in person in downtown Austin this fall. Please join us September 22nd to 24th. Tickets go on sale in May. You can go to festival.texastribune.org for more. Support of our members keeps events like this one free and accessible for all. If you value what you just watched, please sign up and give generously at texastribune.org slash give. Regardless of whether you give, join us next week in person or online for two more great Tribune events on Tuesday, April 12th. My colleague James Barragon will sit down with Greg Kassar, Democratic candidate for Congress in District 35, 8 a.m. at the Austin Club in downtown Austin. The next day, Wednesday, April 13th, I will talk about the work of the 87th legislature in the run-up to the 88th with four state lawmakers from San Antonio, noon on the downtown campus of the University of Texas at San Antonio texastribune.org slash events for details. See you soon, everybody. Thanks very much.